the electrostatic section of the physics paper. Starts with multiple choice, question 1.7, which reads three charged spheres, X, Y, and Z, supported by insulating threads of equal length, hang from a beam as shown in the diagram below. Sphere X is negatively charged. Sphere X attracts sphere Y but repels sphere Z. Which of the following conclusions is correct? And from this, we can see that if X attracts Y, that means that Y must be oppositely charged to X, which since X is negative, that means Y is positively charged. And if sphere X repels sphere Z, that means X and Z have the same charge, which makes sphere Z negatively charged. And so the correct answer is option A. Sphere Y is positively charged and sphere Z is negatively charged. Question seven reads, three small identical metal spheres, P, S, and T, on insulated stands are initially neutral. They are then charged to carry charges of negative 15 times 10 to the minus nine coulombs, Q and positive two times 10 to the minus nine coulombs, respectively, as shown below. The charged spheres are brought together so that all three spheres touch each other at the same time and are then separated. The charge on each sphere after separation is negative three times 10 to the nine coulombs. Question 7.1 asks us to determine the value of charge Q. And we can do this by realizing that when three objects are brought into contact, the charge is shared between them. And then when they are separated, it's shared equally between them. So we can say that the net charge or the new charge on the object after they are brought into contact is equal to the sum of the charge on, in this case, charge P, charge S, and charge T. And that is divided by three, since there are three objects, where we've been told that after separation, the charge is negative three times 10 to the negative nine coulombs. The charge on P was given to us as negative 15 times 10 to the negative nine coulombs. The charge on S is unknown or simply Q, and the charge on T again given as two times 10 to the power of negative nine coulombs. Again, we divide by three because there are three objects that are sharing that charge. And we find that the initial charge on object Q must then be or must have been positive four times 10 to the negative nine coulombs. Question 7.2 asks us to draw the electric field pattern associated with the charged spheres S and T after they are separated and return to their original position. So it's important that they have stated here that it is after they are separated because that implies that they have equal magnitudes of charge. And so we say that each of them has a charge of negative Q. Each of them has the same negative charge and the field pattern that exists between them is drawn showing a repulsive pattern where the field lines are repelled by each other. And we draw that for both of these objects where we show that the field lines are repelled because these two charges are both negative. The last thing that's important here is because these are negative charges, the field lines must have direction and the direction is always towards the negative charge. We know that the direction of a field line is always drawn in the direction that a positive charge would move if placed at that point in the electric field. And so our diagram is correctly drawn like that. The spheres, each with the new charge of negative three times 10 to the negative nine coulombs are now placed at points on the X and Y axis as shown in the diagram below with sphere P at the origin. Question 7.3, state Coulomb's law in words. Coulomb's law as per the guideline document says that the magnitude of the electrostatic force exerted by one point charge on another point charge is directly proportional to the product of the charges and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. 
Question 7.4 asks us to calculate the magnitude of the net electrostatic force acting on sphere P. Important here that they have specified that they only require the magnitude of this force, so there's no need for us to calculate the direction. And so we can see that sphere P will have two forces acting on it. Sphere P, we have been told, has a charge of negative three. Sphere S, all of them have the same charge of negative three times 10 to the negative nine coulombs. What that means is that there are two forces exerted on sphere P. The first is the repulsive force that T exerts on P to the left. And so we say that that is F T P, the force that T exerts on P. And then there is the repulsive force that S exerts on P, which is downward, again, repulsive. And so we call that F S P, the force that S exerts on P. And we can calculate those two forces by using Coulomb's law for each one, where we say the force that T exerts on P is equal to Coulomb's law, Coulomb's constant, the charge on T multiplied by the charge on P divided by the distance between them squared, where K is our constant given as nine times 10 to the nine. The charge on both of these objects is the same, three times 10 to the negative nine. We write that in for each one and the distance between them given in this diagram for the distance between T and P as 0.3 meters. And so we can then say that the force that T exerts on P is nine times 10 to the negative seven Newtons, and that is to the left, although direction doesn't necessarily matter in this case. We can then do the same calculation for the force that S exerts on P, where the forces or the charges are exactly the same, KQS and QP, where the distance is now different. And so we follow the same calculation, showing our substitution, showing the charges on, uh, on each object, and then showing the distance as given here, the distance between those two objects given as 0 0.1 meters, and that must be squared to find that the force that S exerts on P is 8.1 times 10 to the negative six Newtons, and that is downwards. Again, it is a repulsive force. What we now need to do is we need to calculate the net force where we can see that we have two forces acting on this object. We have a force that is acting downward and a force that is acting to the left. So our net force is going to be somewhere in between those two and because those are perpendicular to each other, we can use Pythagoras, which says that the net force squared must be equal to the force that T exerts on P squared plus the force that S exerts on P squared. We can then simplify that to the net force is equal to the square root of FTP, nine times 10 to the negative seven squared, plus FSP, that being 8.1 times 10 to the negative six squared. And we find that the net force acting on this object is then 8.15 times 10 to the negative six Newtons. Again, the question has asked for the magnitude only and so no direction is required. Question 7.5 asks us to calculate the magnitude of the net electric field at the origin due to charges S and T, and what we need to realize here is that charge P is experiencing a force as a result of that net electric field already. And so we can use the formula E, the electric field is equal to the force experienced by the charge experiencing that force. Because we've already calculated the net force acting on that object, we can simply remove or simply take the charge that's experiencing that force into account to find our answer. So the force is the answer from the previous question, 8.15 times 10 to the negative six. And we divide that by the charge on this object, which is three times 10 to the negative nine. And so we see that the net electric field at this point is 2.72 times 10 to the three and that is Newtons per Coulomb. Again, this question specified or asked for the magnitude only, and so we do not need to give 
a direction for this force or for this electric field. Question 7.6 reads, one of the charged spheres, P and T, experienced a very small increase in mass after it was charged initially. Important to remember here that these charged objects or these objects are initially neutral. So when they say after it was initially charged, they say it when it was taken from that neutral charge to its charge of negative 15 or positive 2. The question 7.6.1 then asks, which sphere, P or T, experienced the small increase in mass? And we answer this by remembering that the only charge that can be transferred is that of an electron. The protons are stuck inside the nucleus of an atom and therefore do not transfer. So when we talk about charge being transferred, it is always electrons that are transferred. Electrons carry a negative charge, which means that in order for us to charge P with a negative charge, it must have gained electrons. So in order for P to become negatively charged, we must have added electrons onto that object, which means that by adding electrons, we must have increased its mass very slightly. And so the correct answer to question 7.6.2 is that sphere P must have increased in mass. Question 7.6.2 asks us to calculate the increase in mass by the sphere in question 7.6.1. And we need to do this in two steps because what we first need to do is we first need to calculate the number of electrons that were gained by the sphere. And we do that using the formula number of electrons or number of fundamental charges is equal to the charge divided by the fundamental charge, where the charge that this object has gained is negative 15 times 10 to the negative 9 coulombs. The fundamental charge is given in the information sheet as negative 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19. Again, we use this negative sign because it is the charge on an electron. And so we find that there are 9.38 times 10 to the power of 10 electrons that are transferred onto this object. Question, the question has asked us what mass it has gained though, so we need to say, therefore the mass that is gained is equal to the number of electrons multiplied by the mass on a single electron. The number of electrons we've just calculated as 9.38 times 10 to the 10 electrons and the mass on an electron given in the formula sheet as 9.11 times 10 to the negative 31 kilograms. And so the mass that this object has gained is 8.55 times 10 to the negative 20 kilograms. A question like this is marked according to the marking guidelines where 7.1, we've been asked to calculate the initial charge Q there is one mark allocated for showing or showing some kind of formula with the substitution and one mark for the correct answer with the correct units for coulombs. The electric field pattern is allocated one mark for drawing the correct shape, showing that these field lines repel each other. One mark for showing each arrow pointing in the correct direction towards the negative charge. And one mark for not having any field lines that cross or touch each other in any places. Question 7.3, the marks are allocated for the definition as given in the guideline document, two marks for the underlined section there. And question 7.4 asks for the net electrostatic force where we need to use Coulomb's law here. So we get one mark for showing the Coulomb's law formula, one mark for the correct substitution of each of these values and then we get a mark for showing how we have done this calculation using Pythagoras, so either for one of these two where we get that mark, and then our final mark is for the correct answer again with the correct units. Question 7.5, there was a mark allocated for using a formula, there was a mark allocated for the correct substitution, and a mark again for the correct answer with the correct unit. 
there was another option where you could calculate the electric field as a result of each charge and then add them together um, or use Pythagoras there, that would also have got the three marks. Question 7.6.1 or 7.6.1 was one mark for the correct sphere, sphere P, and then 7.6.2, we got one mark for the substitution in the calculation to find the number of electrons that were transferred, and then one mark for showing the substitution in calculating the mass of those electrons, and one mark for our final answer.